ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is another episode of your favorite podcast, as I always like to say. And I feel like if I say it seven times, it's burned into your memory. So Keeping It Real is your favorite podcast. We're happy to have you here. And ladies and gentlemen, today I have got a Babe Ruth-esque guest on our program. Um, somebody who is well known throughout many different industries, but mine specifically roofing. Anytime the word financing gets brought up, it seems like there's only one name that the world proclaims to be the guy. And I went and uh, asked the guy if he would come on keeping it real today. So it is my pleasure. This is a couple years in the making. I've been wait waiting for this and looking forward to it. Chris Scoville, welcome, my friend, to keeping it real. How are you doing today? Wow. What an entrance. I don't even think my wife likes me that much. Right. That's how I roll. That, that, that was quite an entrance. Let's do that one again. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Um, you're right. I've been um, looking for – I haven't done a podcast in a hot minute. I've been um, busy and traveling and doing this and doing that. and I've been on a podcast in about a month. So um, this is really great that we're doing this on a Saturday. My wife was real excited. She said, oh, my God, you're home. It's so good to see you home. What are we going to do today? And I said, well, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to go get a little workout in. And um, I got a podcast at 10 o'clock with Chuck. So and then she's like, what do you what do you mean a podcast? Yeah, who the hell is Chuck and why is he ruining my life? No, I apologize for that. But it's definitely a get. Going off to get a massage. So she, trust me, she's OK. Everybody wins in this case. So that's awesome. Let's chat, my friend. Um, oh, you and I, we've shared the industry. I've been in it for 25 years. Uh, I don't know how many years you've been in, but it seems like it's been quite some time that we've shared the industry. Yeah. And we actually never met in person until just a few months ago down in Florida. That's right. And that was quite the, uh, quite the honor, for sure, having dinner. But uh, tell me a little bit about your history. Um, obviously, you're not a contractor per se, but... You help contractors worldwide. You help homeowners worldwide. Tell me a little bit about it, and sure. uh, we'll just run with it from there. Interestingly enough, because I don't, um, I don't really lead with the backstory too much, but I can hear because we've got time and we have patience. So, in 1987, I was in high school. I graduated in '89. My father was an attorney and thought it would be a great idea during one of the more interesting economic times, like what we're going through right now in the eighties to open up a construction company. And it was called Roscoe. So my first real building construction experience started in 1987 as we built custom homes. Um, I was right there working with Ross. My dad was Scoville. So Roscoe construction company. So I was right there on the job site with a hammer in my hand and, kind of learning the, the custom home building experience. Graduated in 89, went and got my criminal justice degree because I was going to be a cop until I found out they gave that back then. He got paid like $36,000 to get shot at. And I was like, you know, young, a punk, probably causing too much trouble to be a cop anyway. And I was like, no, that's not for me. So what does any good old boy from the country do? Western New York. I grew up in a farm area called um, Batavia. I headed to Florida. I packed up my Ninja crotch rocket ZX six R like in my Toyota and drove to Florida with no idea really what to do. Other than I knew that Scott Logston from my town owned a construction roofing business. So I get down to Florida and this had to be like 90, 91. And I call him and I said, hey, do you have any work? And he said, sure. Do you know anything about tie beams? And I said, nope, but I'm strong and I'm willing to learn. So 87 custom homes, 90, 91, doing roofs, um, building puds on golf courses up in Port St. Lucie West. So he started a roofing in 90, 91. Um, then fast forward in 1993. So this is what brings me to the life experience of why when people say, hey, I need money or I need contractor financing, um, people reach out to me, which is really nice because it's organic. I've never ran an ad for financing. Um, I got into construction financing in 93. I was uh, the 
associate director for construction of permanent lending in the wholesale industry for a bank in Miami. And we gave money to contractors for construction of permanent um, buildings. So I've been in financing officially since 1993. I had real estate license, mortgage broker license, but I actually worked for a bank running the wholesale construction of permanent. So I was in that industry ever since the great crash of 2008, 2009. Then I opened up in Western New York, Scoville Home Services, which was, I could basically land jobs that I could do in my t small team. And then jobs that I couldn't do, I farmed out and got basis points on those. So it was a kind of a contracting, small home services, subcontracting business. So actually, I don't talk about that much, the construction, the roofing and the Scoville Home Services, but I actually have been in the house. I've been thrown out of the house. I've sold at the table. I've farmed deals out. I've subcontracted. So um, I think that's where the real conversa Rio conversations come from. When I'm shooting the shit with contractors, dude, I've done the work. So a lot of these guys that might work for finance companies came fresh out of college and they put a headset on and they sit in a cubicle and they've never been thrown out of a house. So I get, I get a little bit of instant credibility in the industry because, well, I'm, fr I'm 52 and I've done the work. So that's my absolutely that's my, like the you know four minute history of where I where I've come from. Well, that's awesome because you know, like you say, now everybody knows Chris has been in the industry, he's been in yeah. it for life, and he's gonna continue to help people. Um, for me, it's very interesting that you go from contracting into construction financing. What was the thought process behind that? What led you to that transformation? Uh, was it something you saw in the industry as far as, you know, people need the service or, you know, what kind of led you from, I guess, from one extreme to the other, really, because they aren't really super similar other than no. you're helping one with the other. So no. what was the transformation like and how did that look? I literally tripped into it. So in Florida back then, I was like, well, what am I going to do for a living? You know, I didn't want to do contracting and really know much about it other than I was kind of, I would have to say I was more of a laborer, right? Just doing tie beams. Um, I went and got my real estate license and I'm young, right? And I'm still stupid. <laughs> I'm still crazy. I'm still crazy today. But I was like, oh, this is cool. I'll go get my real estate license. Well, here's me. I walk in to get my real estate license and I go buy my first suit ever. It's Sims. And I walk into Prudential Real Estate and they hired me on the spot. They say, okay, you start on Monday. So I show up on Monday, real estate agent in Florida, ready to go, ready to work. And I walk in and I go to my boss and he says, okay, there's your cubicle. And I went, I sat in and I go, where's, what do I do? Like, there was no guidance at all. Like, literally, I'm like, what did I do? Where's my money? Like, I needed to make money. So maybe after a couple of weeks of not having any really good support, what they should have done is teamed me up with somebody like a mentor system. And I worked underneath them and I did their open houses and I would door knock, but nobody, you know, took me under the umbrella and put me to work. They really should have. I would have probably been really, really good at real estate. But anyway, I needed to make money. So I became a manager of a real estate office that did rentals. Now, back then in the nineties, um, you could make really good money in rentals in South Florida. because South Florida was booming, man. Like big money. So I was managing. I went right in there as sales guy. And then they moved me right into management because I was good on the phone. I was good at closing. I was good at, you know, training. So they moved me right into management. Well, that was real intense. It was just day in and day out. And the boss I worked for was a tyrant. He'd walk in with a silver briefcase and I'd get like severe anxiety. It was a very stressful job, but I learned a lot. I'm really glad. I learned all about Tom Hopkins back then and how to close, ask empathetic questions. I learned so much about sales and I'm, my phone work increased exponentially, always learning from these shitty little jobs that I had. Then I, I said, well, I think I want to get into the mortgage side because, you know, kind of dibbling and dabbling in real estate. I started learning more about mortgage and wholesale. And I said, that's where the money is. The money is in, in financing and the money is working with contractors because I still love working with contractors. So I answered an ad in a newspaper because we didn't have the internet back then. And I sent my resume in on a fax. Yeah, this nice. is like, dude, I'm talking fax machines and newspapers is how I got this job. So Tim Lernahan in Boca Raton sets up the interview over by the Boca Raton Mall off of Glades. And I go in there and I'm ready to get this job. This is great. So we're sitting there and I'm, 
I'm dazzling him. He's liking the energy. And I think I got the job because of the energy. Because when he goes, <laughs> it's this classic, he goes, so what do you know about eights? And I'm like, you mean like uh, measurement units? He said, yeah. And I could tell right there, I was like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Well, I said, well, a lot. And I kind of tried to explain to him eight quarters, half inch, like I'm doing the measurements for what we snap in lines. He looks at me, and goes, you don't have a fucking clue. I go, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm talking points, basis points. 0. 0.125, 0. 0.250, 378. Like, I'm like, he goes, but you know what? He goes, you sold it to me so well, you're hired. And he hired me. Then I had to take the drug test. Do I want to tell this story? Well, I think that the story probably is very crucial to the end. So, I mean, that's completely up to you, my friend. Let's tell, let's I think tell we've, all, we've all got similar stories to that at some point in life, I'm sure. So, now it's time. I got a banking job. Dude, and it was a job. Like, associate director, four weeks vacation, salary plus commission. Like, it was a job, dude. I was going from full commission sales manager, real estate office to a associate director position at a bank and out of Brooklyn and down in Miami and, you know, multiple locations, wholesale construction for the industry was going well. I needed this freaking job. So my roommate that I lived with at the time was a heavy, heavy pot smoker. And I'm like, I'm going to test positive just simply because I live with this dude in a, in a one or two bedroom apartment, whatever it was back then. So I go down to the drug, um, like the head shop where they sell pipes and whatnot. And I said, I need a detox. They're like, this one's the best. You mix it in with a gallon, freaking gallon, drink it the morning of, and drink beet juice. And I'm like, beet juice? I was like, yeah, just do it. Do it. Trust me. So I'm like, okay, cool. Make the tea, drink it, beet juice, go in, pee test, pee clear. Test. Nothing, no results. It's like I took water in there, put it on the thing, and it's like this guy's not even alive. There's nothing in his urine. And he, Tim, my boss, gets the report, says, dude, something happened. You got to take it again. Okay, back to the headshot, Grateful Jays. Get the stuff, do it all over again, go in, and negative. Now my boss calls me to his house on the weekend. Chris, I need you to come over. I go to his house. He goes, listen, I don't know what the fuck's going on. I don't really care. I want to hire you and give you a shot at this. This is going to be life-changing experience. Here's a can of Coca-Cola. <laughs> he goes, please just drink this can of Coca-Cola. Go take the pee test tomorrow. This is your last shot. He goes, I can't do after three. We're done. So I sign up. I take the Coke. I drink the Coca-Cola. I go and I pass the drug test. That's how I got the job. So... I sold my way into the job. Then I almost didn't get the job because I was so nervous about testing positive for marijuana. Because it wasn't, it, back then it was like a freaking crime to smoke weed. Like it was fucking ridiculous. But anyway, um, that's how I got into construction or permanent, wholesale, mortgage lending, working with contractors back in the 1993-ish. <laughs> There you go. And it, it, I don't think it could be any more appropriate than that entry into it because why not, right? It's the construction industry and a little fear of a drug test probably existed in most of them at some point. So good for you. You found your way in and now you are, you know, you're a big deal and it's time to start, you know, building your legacy, focusing on, you know, what you're going to do and how you're going to become famous um, what's it look like when you get started? How does your career kick off there? And how do you get yourself established in that industry? And uh, what kind of obstacles did you have to overcome along the way with that? So back in the 90s, it was different, right? I think we probably fast forward to the to the big failure. I'll fast forward a few years because, dude, we're talking 26 years. So back in the day, it was, oh, this is a good story. So we'd go on business trips. I managed all of Florida. Um, I lived here in Boca Raton. So let's say I go over to Tampa and I'm going to go knocking on the doors of wholesale construction and wholesale mortgage people that sold construction to permanent to contractors. And stay in hotel room. As soon as you get to the hotel room, you grab the big yellow book, the yellow pages, and you go right to mortgage brokers and you rip the whole damn thing out. And then you go to your map 
and you map out where they are and you got your yellow pages and you've got your map in your car and you're driving around Tampa to go meet with these people cold. Like that's the nineties. That's the early two thousands. Right. Then you fast forward to after 2008, 2009, I lost, you know, I was up by now I'm up in new England. I'm doing the same thing. Construction of permanent for a lender called Chevy Chase BF Saul. Everybody gets fired from the mortgage industry. Everyone, we're just all done. And if it's mortgage, 18 years of mortgage, is, right? 18 years of history, mortgage, 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 bank, 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 UHSB, like all the banks, Debbie Chase, BF Saul, IndyMac Bank, all associate director, director, vice president, like all these great, like I should be able to get a job, no problem. 2008, 2009, I couldn't get a job at Home Depot. So I go and work at UPS as a driver. Because I made, you know, six figures. <clears throat> so I drove a UPS truck for a while to make a living. So I'm in the UPS truck. Let's fast forward to, I don't know, 2014, 2015. I'm still in Florida. I get the call from a finance company out in California. Hey, you know, we know you. We worked with you at IndyMac Bank back in the day in the early 2000, 2004, 2008, uh, 2004, 2008, that, that era. Are you interested in getting back into financing? Now, mind you, I'm in Tampa, running a, my own route, you know, full every day, full time UPS in the brown, busting my ass to make a living. Literally, I was probably 180, 175. I'm 245 now. That's how skinny I was. It's 150 degrees in the back of a UPS truck with no air conditioning. And they're jam packed from the front to the back. And it's just it's it's one hell of a job. So I took that phone call and I said, Absolutely. Right. I'm I miss the finance space. I've been doing this for a couple of years. I've been waiting for God to bless me with an opportunity to get back in to work with contractors. And I took that interview and I went right into UPS one day with my garbage bag of browns. And I walked right up to his desk and said, I'm done. And he's like, what do you mean you're done? He said, guys work eight years, nine years on the line to get a union to get their own route. I said, I'm done. I'm going back into finance. He's and the guy was like. What do you mean? Because he didn't know anything in my history. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm not a UPS driver. And I'm not talking bad about, bad about UPS. It was great. I learned the value of a dollar all over again. I said, dude, I'm in sales. Like, I'm in finance, man. I'm out. So they were like fucking shocked because none of them knew that I had this career. I just kept it real quiet on the line. You know, I did. I went in. I did my job. I did my job too well at UPS. I worked my tail off. And the goal there is not to work your tail off as a union guy. It's just to beat the living shit out of the management. So it, that's a whole controversy I don't want to get into. However, um, I got back into finance and then, you know, then I start now we're, we're fast forwarded to, you know, 2015 to where we are today, 2023. Right. Um, now it's building the empire online and really networking and doing all the digital stuff that we do now to attract and help people. So. Nice. So that's that really kicked, that really kicked in, in like 2017, 2018. Yep. Online, right? So that's when I started getting the whole, you know, networking and uh, speaking, doing a lot of speaking engagements and training and trying to build up the whole persona thing here on, on the book and, and Instagram and YouTube and all that shit. So, yeah. So, okay. Let's talk a little bit about that. You, you mentioned, you know, earlier we started in a, a different era, right? You're ripping the phone book pages out. And people nowadays don't even know what a phone book is. Yeah, but yeah. back in the day, you're doing that. You're driving around. You're, 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 you know, meeting people face to face. We didn't have the luxury or, you know, whatever you want to call it of, of the stuff we have today. Yeah. Um, you leave. You go do some stuff different for a while. You get back into it. And now all of a sudden, like you say, it's a totally different world, okay? Old Chris versus new Chris. Okay. When you get back into it, I'm sure you're probably thinking there's going to be a few subtle changes. I'm sure when you got back into it, what was your initial reaction? Okay, damn, this is nothing like what it was before. I'm going to have to completely relearn a bunch of stuff. Or were you pretty able to just kind of slide back in like nothing had happened in, in maybe just a few minor adjustments? I came back in and dominated. And here's the reason why. I've done it before from zero and built up territories from zero and then went and, and troubleshot 
and snipered another area and built that up from zero, right? So I had no problem coming in 2015 and building from zero. I'd already done it. And I was willing to do the work. But here's the bigger, the bigger picture is this. When you learn the value of a dollar all over again and how much it, the value is in a dollar, you work so much harder to go and get that. We lose, and I've done it since then, the appreciation for the dollar, right? So when it was time for me to get back in and get out of that hot truck and get working, I did whatever it took to dominate, man. Like, my, I built the finance business in Florida off of, uh, we didn't have, my wife and I didn't have nothing. We moved here. We had like a one bedroom apartment and boxes up to the thing. And I went to Walmart and I bought a fold out. I've got pictures of it. I've got it online somewhere. I can go search for it, post it up there if anyone wants to see it. It's a little TV tray and it was a folding card, you know, one of those black things. And I left the receipts on it, dude, because I knew that once I started making mo back to money, I was going to take this shit back and buy a real desk with a real chair, right? So I remember sitting at that thing with an, with an Apple computer, like something like this, and just banging it. Emails, phone calls, show ups, door knocking, presentations, demos, sending shit in the mail to them with a handwritten card, like battery chargers. Like doing whatever it took to, to set myself up as a differentiator, learning how to speak from stages properly to motivate people, get people excited about financing rather than it just be like a boring fucking topic, right? So my approach to it was just to go out there, dominate, learn, learn how to speak better, learn how to present, learn how to make it simple for contractors to understand what financing is at the point of sale. And ultimately care about their customers first. Because if we don't take care of who the contractor's customers are, then this, none of this is worth anything. And I think we all lose sight of that with all the noise and all the technology that we lose sight. We get so caught up in our stupid features and our stupid benefits. Instead of thinking, what does your customer need? What does your customer want? And how can we freaking solve for that? And if we take it back to that core of simplicity, each and every time with whatever we do, and we think about the customer's needs and wants first and how we can provide a solution to that, and then reverse engineer whatever we sell, you'll always win if you put your customer's needs and wants first. What a novel you're just concept. Educating, you're educating, providing a solution, and helping them out. So whenever I talk to a contractor, I take that instead of, in, you just, we do this, this, this. Who gives a shit? 17 other lenders out there do that too. How can the things that I do help your customers and help you achieve the solution to bring to them? That's the focus when you're when you're selling something, right? When I say let's build something, it means hey, let's build something. What, what do we build? Are we going to build a business? Are we going to build a financing thing? Are we going to build a solution? Are we going to build what are we going to build for your customer? Are we going to build a roof for them? Are we going to build an air conditioning? Are we going to build an outdoor, you know, some siding? Like what are we going to build? And who are we going to build it for? So. I love it, man. What passion. And that's that's awesome because you're right. People don't like financing. Financing's like roofing. Like it's the F word. It just it basically represents a payment. And and it's hard for people to accept and say, Well, yeah, I love that. It's gonna be awesome. More money coming out of my pocket, but I see tremendous value. I've been in the roofing industry 25 years. I've sold residential roofs to people. <laughs> that probably, you know, couldn't have afforded to take care of it otherwise. Yeah, I've yeah. helped a lot of people over the years. I've helped people to improve the value of their properties and it's been very fulfilling. Um, let me ask you this. Okay. When you, you get into, to the financing deal, you're working with, I'm assuming all different trades. You're, you're working, you know, with contractors across the board, you're, you're back in, like say you, instantly start dominating you start getting in with the right people start making the relationships um getting getting in front of the right people how long does it take you to you know go from hey i'm chris i'm the new guy i'm hitting you up i'm, I'm emailing you from my apple computer from my little tiny tv tray to i'm chris the man and everybody that that talks about financing now speaks my name because i've done all this hard work what what does that journey look like for you? And was there a particular moment, a particular event where 
you instantly felt a change in your momentum or you felt like, hey, I just went to another level and now I can clearly see where I'm going with this and it's completely to the moon. Um, what's that What's that look like for you as far as, you know, getting from step one to step two and then ultimately beyond that? If I didn't just make that question like no, a I, too I think, complicated. I, no, I think you're good. So I think initially when I started kind of the online thing really – trying to figure it all out was 2018, 2019. I don't think I've really felt like I'm the guy to go to until just this past like two, maybe two, three years. No, maybe even four. So because I offer um, educational posts, right? And I'm not selling I don't, I've, I don't know if I've ever gone into a group and just made a, po a post pitching people on anything. So I think the approach has to be, and I probably could do better on this because I see a lot of guys go into groups and ask questions. And I'm just, don't ever want anybody to think, oh God, here comes Scoville again with this stupid question just to attract people to get likes and get people commenting on it so he can call me and pitch me. I love the approach of when somebody goes into any of the groups out there and says, hey, anybody know who I should contact for financing, who I should use for financing? What are the pros and cons or what do you like about them? And I like bum, 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 people tagging me because then I can be genuine. I can answer the person's particular question without pitching. And then I can literally go to their DM and set my appointment with them to have a private one. I want to learn about their business and learn about what their customers' needs are. So I think that I started to see it since maybe 2019, now we're in 2023, more organic, organic, organic. I've never had an ad for financing. I have 36,000 contractors in my database. I've never ran an ad for financing. I have 36,000 contractors in my database that I can market to. I've never ran an ad for financing and I have unbelievable organic growth from it. So I think to answer you, it's been 2020 to 23 is where I've really felt the, I've done a good job at delivering results for contractors. So people are so kind and I'm so thankful that people tag me because without that, Nobody would know who I am because I don't run ads and I don't do that whole loud thing online and I just don't do it. Should I? Maybe. Is it a risk? Yeah. I don't want to ever get kicked out of a group for being pitchy, nor do I think I have to pitch. So on my, my group called the Contractor Coffee Shop, I put videos, an educational thing on my YouTube channel. I post videos <laughs> teaching people how to sell financing at the point of sale for free. On my personal page, every single day, I put educational, inspiring, sometimes funny videos about financing. And it ain't always about financing. Sometimes I'm talking about how to get more reviews, how to get more referrals, how to retain, how, how to give rewards to your customers. Sometimes it's sales. It's not always financing, although to me, it always seems like it is because it all leads back to money anyway. But I'm just trying to be diverse, authentic, real and not pitchy because I see guys that go into these groups and they're super pitchy and I go, oh, fuck, they're going to get thrown out of this thing. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine ever getting like thrown out of a group because I just want to help people. And if I get thrown out of a group, how the hell would I ever help people? Like, I don't know. I mean, I go, oh, I've got 36,000 contractors that I can email and call. So I guess I'm, I'm okay. My buddy got, my buddy got thrown off of Facebook the other day for something that he did in a private group two years ago. They shut him down for four freaking days. Dude was freaking out. Really good guy too. And he's not controversial. He's not salesy. He ain't bitchy. He's like, Chris, I don't know what to do. He goes, I'm running ads for clients right now. I can't get online and manage them. I don't know how to reach out to anybody to let them know that I've been thrown off. Dude, it screwed him up for four days. He's freaking out. I go, bro. You better figure something out around social media because if, if Facebook shut you down and you've lost your business, then you don't have a business. No, and that boy, your that whole, is scary. That is scary. That just your whole thing is trusting the great Zuck. Yeah. You're dude, what are you doing? 
Yeah, your rhyme was zucked. There's no doubt about that. And that's, uh, ooh, that's brutal. You hate to hear those kind of things, what, but it's... If Facebook shut down tomorrow, wow. Imagine, imagine the books that we would read. That'd be kind of cool. I'm not going to lie. I've taken a liking to Facebook over the course of time. I've been on it for a long time. And it has helped me substantially yeah. with business and my personal branding and all that. But I do remember the days when we didn't have all this stuff. And it wasn't oh. such a bad time. I kind of enjoyed it, you know? I we, was we thinking did, about we, that today. We, we did things different. We showed up. We had exactly. conversations in the parking lot. As kids, we would hop on our bikes and go down to Pizza Hut, cause fucking trouble outside. <laughs> I haven't Indeed. seen a group of kids hanging out in a parking lot in forever. Dude, I do see this. I'm guilty of it. When I go out with my wife now, I try to flip it upside down and set it over on the other side. You know, like I see couples sitting there at dinner with staring at their phones. And I'm probably it's guilty of it, so I'm not throwing stones at a glass house. But, man, we are addicted. It's true. It's it's a simple life that we live now where everything's right at the touch of a button. It's right at your fingertips. And there are plenty of advantages, right? Like you've got programs, I'm sure, that can help people that are direct from the fingertips. And let's talk a little bit about the positive side of the, the technology and how yeah. it's working for us. Um, with me years ago, I worked for a roofing company over in College Station, Texas, and we offered financing options to our homeowners. And I think we were one of the first ones in that area because it was just amazing how well it worked. Um, but one of the things that I had to deal with, and I'm like you, Chris, I'm here to help. I want to make people's lives better. I want to do what I can. Yep. Somehow I accidentally got into roofing 25 years ago and it changed my life. So I want to do what I can to help people. But there were times when I would go into people's homes and we would come up with solutions and it would be, you know, well, we don't have $10,000. We don't have 12, whatever. Okay, cool. Let's look at these financing options. Yeah. People get in and they start going through the process. Um, back then we actually were having to like call and do it in the living room. Right. Yeah. And this yeah. sucked because synchrony wells, maybe. Yeah, we, well, we were using um, Green Sky. Green Sky, yeah. And it was like, in. okay, this is a good finance company. They're going to take good care of you, but they're a little bit strict, okay? And there is nothing worse than sitting in someone's home after you've gone through the presentation, you've done the entire process, they're ready to move forward. You go and you do the call, and it's like, okay, I'm here with Mr. and Mrs. Jones. We're trying to finance 30 grand, yada, yada. And they say, okay, you know, take the information. The worst feeling in the world is when they put you on hold and you look at the homeowner and the homeowner would say something like, well, now it's in God's hands. And it's like, no, 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 no. No, it's like, not. It's in the God bank. knows if you were paying your bills or not. Like, don't put it in his hands right now. If, you, if you've got something to tell me, tell me oh, now. <laughs> and it was bad. So for a while, I was afraid to really do the option because it was like, oh, man, that's a horrible scenario. And it yeah. wasn't always people that you would look at and think, they're not going to get approved. Obviously, right. sometimes you can, but sometimes you just you go to a nice person and they've just extended themselves too far. So yeah. I didn't do financing for a while. Got back into the roofing down here in San Antonio. We started offering some options where you could send a link and pre-qualify people, right? Yeah. So yeah. has this been something that you've seen has improved the way that contractors look at it, because to me, I always just thought, damn, I don't even want to do the, the financing yeah. just well, because of the awkwardness of being in someone's house that's about to get denied. Such a great question. Thank you um, for bringing that up. This is awesome. So a few things. First of all, we call that the pregnant pause. Mm -hmm. That's the moment where you click to see if they're going to get approved. And it's the utter the worst do, 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 do. right you're like what do i do i've done all my song and dance they like me they want to do business with me everything hinges on their approval right so pregnant pause okay so technology um first off and i will rem leave them remained anonymous there's a few lenders out there that call themselves home improvement lenders that are not home improvement lenders and they've unfortunately tainted the roofing industry exponentially. Um, whereas with what happened with you, you're like, shit, I don't ever want to do that again. It was horrible. 
the contractors think that these two entities are actually home improvement lenders when they're not. So what I have to do a lot with roofers, especially because they've marketed the, to the roofing space, is undo the fact that those aren't home improvement lenders, they're brokers, and that's not now how real lending works. So I have to sometimes unpack that they call themselves home improvement lenders. They're not. They're brokers. And it's an awful, awful, awful experience. If you've ever been with it, you're paying a, a, a brokerage house or a lender for financing. Stop it. Call me. I'll help you. Stop it. You don't need to pay to offer financing. Okay. So with that being said, tainted. Um, if you've offered financing, if something has happened at the point of sale and it's frustrated, you go, Home improvement financing is it's so bad. I, I, lose, I lose deals because of it. It takes time. It's hard. It's not. You've just been, you've gone down the wrong road. I can fix that for you. So I understand where you're coming from, Chuck, with what happened with you. And you're like, fuck, I don't ever want to do that again. So to answer your question, now it's this simple. So it is a soft credit pull where nobody gets impacted negatively at the point of sale. It's 13 seconds for the approval for the max approval on what their maximum that they can finance is soft credit pull. So you haven't taken their credit score down five or seven points. Some of the lenders out there do. We don't. Mr. Miss Smith, congratulations. You're approved to sixty five, one hundred thousand dollars. Would you prefer a 12 month same as cash with no interest or would you prefer a monthly payment of one hundred fourteen dollars per month with no prepayment penalty? That's how easy Chuck it is now to offer financing. Mr. And Mrs. Smith, you know, you love me. You're going to do business with me. Um, we've got a couple options. Are you going to be using your money to pay or would you like to use some of ours? And now the customer has to say something because you asked the question, correct? Yep. Are you going to be using your money? Or you, would you like to use some of ours? Empathetically ask that question. So they're going to answer you. They're not going to just sit there and stare at you. They're going to either say, here's our insurance check. Here's our cash. Here's a check. Here's our credit card. Or what do you mean? And you almost kind of want them to say, what do you mean, right? Because then you can go, well, third party, remove yourself as the bad guy. We, point over there, work with lenders, lenders plural. So now you're killing the objection of the head that you only have one lender. We work with lenders that offer financing solutions. It's so simple. Matter of fact, I have some really neat technology here that in 13 seconds without pulling your credit report, I can find out what you're approved to. We've got payment options like no interest, no payment. If you don't want, you know, if you just want to pay it off over time with no interest, or if you prefer a low monthly payment option, we have those up to 15 years too. Sound interesting? They have to answer you again mm -hmm. and they'll go, wow, is it that easy? And let's say your contract's 10,000. You go, yeah, matter of fact, if you're approved, if you're approved by the lender based on your credit and your ability to repay, which is called the debt to income, your payment could be as low as 114 bucks a month. So wait a minute. You're telling me that illustration time, 10,000 or 114 per month. If you put this, whoop, there we go, this contract in front of somebody, they may tip over and tell you to pack sand because they want to go get more bids, right? Yep, absolutely. They may want to go get more bids because this number might be like, well, shit, I, I don't know how we're going to pay for that. I don't have 10 grand in my bank account. Yep, but if a lot you of say, money. You know what? We've got payment options from this. They can digest $114 a month because they're, that's how they're paying for everything. Their cable, their car, their mortgage, their this, their groceries, their gas. They're already paying everything monthly. So if you can stop scaring them with a big number, I'm doing this backward, from a big number to a small number, it stops the bidding process. And if you can get them financing within 13 seconds and it's paperless and it's harmless and there's no W-2s and there's no taxes and those pay stubs, and then the money goes directly to your ACH account when you're done with the job in five days, not to the consumer, you, the contractor, get the money into your account so you don't have to go chase the customer down to collect the money. That's how easy this shit is now, Chuck. Yep, and I absolutely love it. So I see that there's going to be, and it, you are an expert in this, so I'm sure you've already seen a huge influx because of the way 
contractors are now having to deal with insurance claims and the way that they've slowed them down to the point where AR. contractors are upside down a lot, you know, and it's hard. And I, I, I personally do believe it's an attempt to squeeze and to get rid of a lot of people that are kind of mid level that may not, you know, maybe like to supplement too much or do whatever the, the deal is that they're looking at. So the money gets drawn out and you're a small, you know, like one to $3 million company. This is literally going to kill you. So the way that I've seen a lot of contractors here recently start to pivot and transition is instead of saying, okay, Mr. And Mrs. Homeowner, we're going to wait and do everything for these insurance proceeds and you don't have to pay us anything until they pay it to you. And they've kind of formulated a different strategy and it's like, Hey, now, instead of going that traditional route, which sucks for us, we can make it appeal. Because like you just said, a, a nice $114 payment looks really good on paper. They're going to get a large sum of money from the insurance. What do you think as far as the ability to shorten the cycle with the contractors and make it appealing to the homeowner? Because like you were saying, you know, a soft credit pool doesn't really take anything off your credit, but... Right. If you decide to move forward with it at that point, there is going to be that concern, that slight pushback. What does that look like as far as being able to say, okay, this is why this is beneficial to you, beneficial to us. How would you provide that information to a homeowner to make it make sense to basically finance their depreciation and then them take care of it on the back end when they get the opportunity? Great. Love it. So we can. I love it. This is my whiteboard. Nice. Whiteboard. Okay. <laughs> we can wrap in a deductible. We can wrap in the cost of the roof. We can wrap in the upgrades into one loan. Let's say it's 15 grand. Let's say it's 20 grand. Boop. And we can give them a 12 month, no interest, no payment. So when their insurance check comes in for 15 grand, fair? 15? Yep. Cost of the roof was 15? 15 is good. 15 comes in from the insurance when six, seven months, eight months, nine months. I'll give a shit. Anytime. Yeah, it doesn't matter at that point. Anytime between one month and 12, I don't care. $15,000 comes in. They send $15,000 to the lender. They only have $5,000 to pay off. Roofer, when is the roofer paid on that job? The roofer is paid on that job as soon as the job's complete. And the roofer gets their money, which helps them with their cash flow. And they don't have AR standing out there, right? Yep. And the consumer has a no interest, no payment for 12 months. And the consumers paid their the deductible, the cost of the roof, and any upgrades. Because we did some new gutters. We did something that was an upgrade. Maybe we sold a maintenance agreement for the three. I don't, whatever. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Financing is a product. Yep. It's, it's, it's just part of the construction project. So if we can eliminate the... The fight, the frustration, the cash flow image, the cash flow issues, the accounts receivable. If we can position a finance solution that the consumer can just get that insurance check someday from their insurance carrier. I don't know how the hell that works. I don't give a shit. It's not my expertise. And then they can send that to the lender because there's no prepayment penalty. It's made the life of the roofer easier because he got paid for what he's supposed to do, which is building roofs. The consumer's got their roof on and five days and their neighbors are tarped for a year and a half. Dude, I see it down here. I still see it over in Port Charlotte. Oh, the yeah. West Dude, they still have blue tarps over there. You as a roofer can go in in five days and build the roof, right? Yep. You get paid, on day, you get paid on day six or seven. So I think that the presentation has to be buttoned up to say, here's how we do it at Chris's Roofing. We're going to put you into a 12-month no-no. We're going to wrap in your deductible cost of the roofs plus the upgrades into one loan. You've got 12 months to pay this off with no interest, no payment. Take the statement and throw it away for 11 months. Pay it on before the 12. And then when your insurance check comes in, send it to the lender. There's no prepayment penalty. Sound good? I mean, it's a dude. It's a paradigm shift. I'm sure some stormers on here, restoration guys, will, will not like me or hate me or say, no, that's not the process, Chris. It won't work. But you know what? I they won't did. be around very long to, to I don't know. Me, I'm not here frankly. to argue. I'm not here to argue with anybody. I'm here to provide solutions to help roofers get paid faster and exactly. to help them stay in business and have better cash flow. And ultimately, what did I say in the beginning? Who do I really care about? 
The homeowners. The, the homeowners going to have a freaking roof on their house in five days, not seven months. I like it, man. And so I, to you me, know, yeah, that that's you're doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's passion. And if anybody is in the industry and they offend, are offended by that, eh, you probably shouldn't be in this industry anyway. So whatever. If you get offended by Chris helping way. people, I don't know. There's some guys in Texas that know 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 how to do this and. And if they can magically get money for insurance jobs in five days, dude, roll Knock that yourself out. out. Yeah. That's Show amazing. me. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's unheard of. So I can definitely appreciate that. One concern that comes to mind through this process, because yeah. I've experienced this publicly uh, in a previous life as well. You do the project. Okay. Yeah. I always utilize the the depreciation as the homeowner's leverage for the contractor to make sure everything's done properly, to make sure they're completely satisfied, to make sure that, you know, everything is, is to their liking. Yeah. And I tell them, you know, if a contractor tries to get the money from you beforehand, mm -hmm. be wary because, you know, you, you have rights as a, a homeowner. Yeah. Okay. On the opposite side of that, let's say you do a terrific job, but Mrs. Jones is a little bitch and she decides to call the finance company and say, don't pay them because I'm not satisfied with whatever. There was a, a nail that I found in my yard. There was something. At what point does the consumer um, have to agree that, that the work is done to their satisfaction? And at what point do you look at it and say, okay, that's just ridiculous. We're going to go ahead and pay this out anyway because homeowners can be crazy sometimes. Great question. We call those the one percenters. A small percentage are just difficult, let's face it. So here's a cool thing. Now, I can't speak for the other lenders, but I will speak for what we do. Um, we have an arbitration mediation person right in Atlanta, and she handles those. So here's how it works for payout. Job's done. It's buttoned up. I don't need a COC, a PTO, or a final permit to get you paid. You go to your portal. You press job done. Boom, sends a text message to Mrs. Smith. We're paying Chuck. Yes? No. She's happy. The work's done. They picked up all the rusty nails out of the driveway. Yes, you get paid. She says no. A box pops up and says, why? Please explain. Well, I don't like the way the end caps look and the plum, midnight plum, doesn't look midnight enough for me. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's what she said. Goes to arbitration. Arbitration will then, because I don't have, I don't need a, a contract or anything sent in, Chuck to get you money. I don't need anything to get you paid. Now my mediation person can say, hey, Chuck, you know, we got a complaint. The customer doesn't want to pay you because they don't like the way the end cap or shingle tile, whatever, it doesn't matter. They don't like the way the color looks. Well, it sounds like that's an issue between the manufacturer, which I'll name um, unmentioned here, and the consumer's mentality is like, that's not our problem. You signed a contract that says midnight plum, now you're going to send in your closed permit because the job is done to spec. And then you're going to send that to the lender and the lender's going to go, well, she signed a contract for midnight plum. Okay. That sounds like a warranty issue. If they're not, you know, if it really isn't midnight plum and it's slate gray and we've got a closed permit. So the County of Texas, where Broward or wherever close out the job. So it's actually to spec. We're going to pay the contractor. Now, I've seen contractors send in for payment on jobs that they've even gone to. Mm -hmm. So the consumer's like, what do you mean pay him? He ain't here yet. Right? That's a problem. We're not going to pay the contractor then. We're getting done. So work has to be done. I've all in the window industry, this is a good one. 36 windows. One of them comes in and it's mismeasured. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? We want yeah. to pay the contractor because he's got 35 windows done. And one was mismeasured from the manufacturer. So it can get sticky out there. Here's the great thing. A real good lender will have an arbitration mediation group that works between the contractor and the consumer to get it paid. Here's another beautiful thing with us. We do up to 50% progress pay. So we're going to help the contractor get paid prior to installation up to 50%. Nice. That helps cash flow. If you're with a lender and they don't have a process to handle the one percenters, find a new lender. You need to have a lender that works with you on your side, but also understand your consumer's issues. But a lot of this stuff really falls back on workmanship warranty 
and manufacture warranty, Chuck. Yep, I agree. And I appreciate God, I've been that. Doing, dude, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, I I've appreciate that because that's not the way that it is for some I've people. Seen, I've seen it all. And, and I'm, I don't know if I can give a plug to Company Cam. Absolutely. Why cool. not? So let me give you a plug to Company Cam. $75,000 job, huge tile job over in Clearwater. Good friend of mine, roofing company. Another lender that I used to work at uh, a few years ago. Chris, we got a problem. What's up? She she won't pay us. I'm like, why? She goes, end cap. She didn't like the way that the tile, she's like, well, the cement shouldn't be that color. And I don't like the way it looks. It looks like she was just very difficult. She was a one percenter. Yeah. And I said, all right, cool. Send me the contract. Send me the final, per send me the final permit. And normally we don't need all this stuff. I'm like, send it to me and I'm going to send it to the underwriter. So he sends me contract, final permit, and 236 pictures in his company cam file in a zip drive. I had him paid in five minutes. Why? He saw what was going on and you were able to say, hey, this, this isn't legit. Dude, closed permit, contract done to spec, and 236 beautiful pictures of showing them what the project started like in the middle, in the build, in the end, how they cleaned up and how they left it buttoned up. Dude, it, you guys, if you're not documenting with builder comms or company cam or any of the other great built-in CRM features out there, your photos, document everything. Because if you have a customer that's a one percenter and you have data, you're done. You'll win. That the, the underwriter looked at the pictures and was like, this lady's crazy. She was. And guess what? We paid the contractor $75,000. He called me. He's like, dude, that was fast. I'm like, bro, I, this isn't even me. This is on you because you kept such unbelievable, impeccable records. It wasn't me. I was just the guy that said, hey, do you have company? They did. Yeah. So it, document everything. Cover your ass because there's nothing forcing somebody to take out financing. Even if somebody, Chuck, gets approved for financing and it's 100% financing, they can still give you cash at the end of the job and not take the financing. They don't have to use financing. It's just a tool to get the job done. So, Absolutely. And I would real quick like to say, shout out to Company Cam. I'm always looking for sponsors here on Keeping It Rio. See, I've got Roofer up there. Roofer's a little bit lonely up at the top of the screen right now. I've kind of changed it up a little bit. Yeah. If Company Cam would ever like to find themselves up there, you know, hanging out well, with we, Roofer oh, on the do. screen we and Keeping It Rio. Take, we got to take this snippet, send it over to Michael Groggins over there, and you'll have a new sponsor. See, there you I've go. been telling That's... this story over and over again. They know me. They're well aware of the story that I told. And here's the reason why. I'm not getting paid by company camp. They got a contractor paid, and I'm pretty sure that 80% of the reason why that guy got paid his money is because he documented on their tool. Absolutely, and that's the whole purpose. So congratulations, Company Cam. You've given us something that, you know, a lot of people don't utilize as well as they should. And I've got a story similar to that from years gone by. Mine was a police officer, and I had to tell him he was wrong, and he wasn't a good enough police officer to understand that I had evidence from before, during, and after. And there you go. The good apologized. lesson in all this, man, is, you know, we all get busy and contractors get busy, but we can't get so busy that we forget to cross the T's and dot the I's and make sure that we're covering our asses on these jobs. You know, yep, that's hey. the only people that are going to get screwed in the deal are the ones that are not doing that because yeah, they're guys, not going to have what they need. When your guy goes with the magnet in the yard to pick up the nails, videotape it and send it to your customer saying, Mr. Smith, I just want to send you this video that we have magneted your yard to pick up as many nails as we can find. However, mm -hmm. sometimes we miss them, but we're doing everything we can to do that. If you happen to find some after we're gone, let us know because Johnny will come back out and do another sweep. But I want to send you this evidence that we've done this and here's the areas that we've done it in. Now the guy gets a nail in a week. How's he going to feel? How's he he's gonna much called? less pissed off. Dude, he's much be less. Like, they did the fucking work. I saw mm -hmm. him. He sent me the video and he said he'll come out here. What are you going to do? So I know that seems so little, but it's massive. And Chuck, I know this. And here's the reason why. 
I'm so passionate about this shit, but it's like will help so many contractors if they pay attention to these little details. Well, we did a major remodel project in the house. Outside that black door is all new flooring throughout the house and a new kitchen and island. And it was fucking expensive. So we had to do this flooring project, which went from 12000 to 18000 because they had to raise it and they had to do a lot of stuff. Beautiful job. Everything was just knockout. Do you know what they didn't do? They didn't clean the freaking mortar mix out of my pavers here in Florida. And it discolored massive areas. So they did a five-star job inside my house. And they did a one-star job in my driveway and didn't come back for seven months to clean it. Mm. Do you know what the review was? It's one star, I'm guessing. It wasn't five stars for what they did inside. It was one star because they didn't come back and fix my driveway. Think about that as a contractor. Your job isn't just the job. It's how you clean up the job. And my father always taught me that. He, my, my father raised me with work ethic like no other. The job ain't done until you've swept. That's what he said, because I used to cut lawns and paint, and I used to do everything in this little small farm town that I grew up in. I go door to door and sell cherries and apples in a big, huge wheelbarrow. Like, the job ain't done until you swept. They forgot the sweep. The job was never done. So I gave them a one-star review, and they kept calling. Why'd you leave us a one-star review? I said, you guys ain't back to fix my driveway yet. Took them that long. Sometimes, you know, and and what a shame. They came back and did it, and I gave them a three-star review. She's like, are you going to get a five? I said, no. No, I'll meet you in the middle because. Yeah, well, a five and a one is going to be a three, and that's what you're going to get because I had to wait so long. And I try so hard to impress that upon my sales reps. That is the part that the homeowners, and and it's always realistic expectations. I love what you said, okay? We're going to give our best effort. I can't guarantee you that I'm going to get every nail. And then I come up with some mathematical equation, and I'll pull out like, with all the, the synthetic underlayment and all the cap nails and all the nails for the starters and the shingle, 57,000 nails are coming off, you know, and I don't, I don't know, 57,000 is a pretty big number. If we get 95%, then there's still going to be, you know, 175 nails that we, we don't get and be aware of that. And it took me having a guy threatening to beat the living shit out of me one time on a Sunday afternoon because his daughter stepped on a nail to understand and i told him look i said this in our our expectations you know and it's there it's in writing you signed it but maybe i wasn't clear enough and you know from that point on i said the most important detail you can give the homeowner is that one and that's the smallest detail and it's the one that's probably going to be the one that that gets them the most time so why not just set that expectation now and they might still be pissed off if they get a flat tire, their kid steps on a nail. I would be too, but at least it won't be directed at you personally for failure to let them know. So yeah. I can appreciate it. Um, we're coming up, Chris. I like to keep wow. these at like an hour. We're at yeah. 58 minutes and I still got two things I want to ask. So okay, go ahead. if it's cool with you, we'll go a little bit past the hour. So uh, the first of the two questions I'd like to ask you and I, like I said, we met back in Fort Lauderdale in May. I was there for the business 411 um, SOP class that Liz was putting on and also was there with Roofer. And you were there as a guest for the Roofer Roadshow. You mentioned that you had just gotten back from doing the one in Savannah. Tell me a little bit about your experience. Okay. You're going out there, you're talking with contractors on the road, obviously spreading the name of yourself and getting yourself out there to more and more people. Um, overall receptiveness of contractors to you on the roof for road show and your overall impression of that entire uh, production. I'm getting ready to do the one here in San Antonio this coming week, but what have your thoughts been about the roofer show? And uh, do you feel like it's been beneficial to you business wise? Yeah. I mean, they, they asked me to come and be a guest. um, And I was like, yeah, no hesitation. First off, uh, the culture at Roofer is like no other. Like Richie and the team have built that company because he's hired the right people. The culture is like no other. They do events like no one else. And I mean, and I've done them all. Uh, how Mao sets them up and takes care of us as speakers and how she takes care of each of the attendees to how they set you up to check you in and make sure that you've got good breakfast and a great lunch and good coffee and good snacks throughout the day to great speakers and then 
all of the value that's that's driven from it. And then in an open environment to network with other people during the lunch breakout. And then after is where the real value is, is meeting other people and sitting down and, and networking. Nothing but five stars across the board for the couple events that I've done with Roofer. They're so professional. And I just, I just, I really feel part of, it's odd to say this. I feel, I feel part of the Roofer family. Like when I travel and I'm going to go speak for Roofer, I'm wearing all their stuff. I've got the sweater, Roofer, and I've got the t-shirts, Roofer, and I'm in the gym, Roofer, and I'm like branded with them because I feel part of the organization when they've got me on stage, number one. Number two, I approach was still never pitchy. It's educational. So when I spoke, it was, you know, maybe a half an hour. I probably went over, like always. Mm -hmm. The receptiveness of people reaching out to set up appointments. I think we had about 40 owners at the last one. And I have 32 demos. Nice. 32 demos out of 40 set up to talk about how we're going to integrate financing in their business. Yeah, I would say probably one of the highest ROI events I've ever done in history. I mean, I've been to plenty of shows and trade shows and never walked away with 40 new leads that people are ready to learn, execute, and scale. So, yes, hats off to Roofer for throwing tremendous events with tons of value. Yeah, shout out to them. I feel like I'm part of the family as well. I'm proud yeah. to have that roofer logo up there on the screen yeah. and to work with those guys. I actually had one of my business partners um, get fully set up with his roofing company with him yesterday. So yeah. huge honor working with them. I can't wait for the one in San Antonio this week. The last question I always like to end with, um, you're already the most well-known guy in the financing industry, especially for contractors. Like I say, anytime somebody posts up any question asking about financing, it's now a joke. You're like, you know, I was like the 37th person to say Chris Scoville, but I was like, Hey, just cause I didn't see anybody else mention this guy, I'll mention his name. So you've done this organically. You've said clearly 36,000 contractors in your database, but you've never run a single ad. That is freaking impressive for, for one. But number two, if there's one or two people left in the industry or in the trades in general that could work with you, that could benefit from your services, that could follow you on social media, learn things from you because you are constantly providing value. You're not trying to pitch anybody. What are the best methods for people to get a hold of you? Number one, to do business. And number two, just to follow Chris Scoville, the guy, and kind of get caught up in his passion for Maybe, financing and see what's to, up. Just to learn what to do with your hands when you're getting a picture taken at a conference. So check this out. I did want to touch on that. You can clearly see that I have figured out what to do with my hands with the podcast, right? I put them below the camera line. So there's no, there are no hands. And I even made it. So if I put my hand up my screen, well, it's not doing it now. My screen gets dark. So I'm, I'm very aware that I'm one of those hand type guys <laughs> And when I was at Lee Hate's studio, it didn't have the same setup. So you could just see me constantly doing this with my hands. And I'm definitely a, a hand talker for sure. Well, so that, I appreciate well, that. There's some funny videos that went out yesterday. So to answer your question, you want to connect with me. It's real simple. On Facebook, it's Christopher Scoville. And then if you go to YouTube, I think it's Chris Undersource Scoville or the Sco Show. Let's just, let's just start the relationship over on Facebook at Christopher Scoville, you can follow me there. Date before we get married. I got yeah. you. Yeah. And then I have a little private group called the Contractor Coffee Shop. And that's on Facebook too, where, you know, I've got some coaches that bring some value in there. We don't have any marketers in there. Marketing. It's literally, if anybody goes in there and markets, I, I, I just block them. So nobody's ever marketed anything in the Contractor Coffee Shop. And we have like 3,000 contractors in there. And nobody's pitching anybody. It's kind of like a little quiet group because we I don't want 10,000 people in there because I don't want people pitching SEO to you. So yeah, absolutely. Thank contractor you. Contractor coffee shop, private group, Christopher Scoville, Facebook, and then we can grow the relationship from there. And then, you know, just if you got questions, DM me and I'll send my link to you and we'll do a 15 to 30 minute call so I can learn about your business. And then we can how we can help your customers. It's that like that's it. It's just not rocket science. It's so simple. it is not rocket science. We're looking to help as many people as we can. We're looking to yeah. finance as many projects, get as many people taken care of, and keep that money moving for the contractors. So Ooh. 
I end keeping it real by saying this. Chris Scoville, thank you, my friend, for your time on Saturday morning. It has been a couple years in the making, and I'm thankful that we had the chance to chat today. I can't wait to the next time I see you in person. We're going to have a drink or we're going to go grab dinner or something. Uh, you are doing tremendous things, not just for the roofing industry, but for construction in general, and most importantly, for the homeowners that you're helping. So thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time. All the people that watch Keeping It Real, I always say thank you guys for your support. If one person watches this and it helps you, then it was worth my time, and I love doing it. So it's cool. We'll keep doing it until it's it's not cool anymore. And I always end every episode with the cheesiest tagline in the history of all podcasts, which is keep on keeping it real. We'll love see it. you guys next time. Later on.